Former senior police officer in the Western Cape, Marius van der Westhuizen, will be applying for parole after serving about 12 years of his 24-year sentence. Marius van der Westhuizen was the acting station com commissioner at the Claremont police station in the Cape Peninsula when he shot and killed his three children aged 21 months, 5 and 16 years to punish his wife for not listening to him. SABC News spoke to his former wife, Charlotte, who is also a police captain. She will be opposing the parole because she believes he's not rehabilitated. Charlotte van der Weshuizen fears for her life and those of her close family. She believes her former husband has not been properly rehabilitated. He blamed everyone, including her and the whole police management for his actions because his wife would not listen to him. That night he said, you must make a choice, me or the job. And then I told him, it's not a matter of a choice. You are my husband, this is my job, this is also responsibilities that I have. And then in his mind, he said, okay, you have made your choice you will bear the consequences. So it was to punish me. It was a life of emotional abuse with strict rules she had to adhere to. I was supposed to be at home every afternoon at five o'clock with the kids. I wasn't allowed to wear my uniform. He didn't want me to wear my uniform. I wasn't allowed to attend meetings in the evenings, like the CPF meetings and stuff. And... I didn't obey the rules. By opposing the former acting commissioner's parole application, Charlotte says she's standing up for herself and her murdered children, whom she feels she couldn't protect that night. He has to take ownership and own up to what he has done. I still don't think he has owned up to what he has done. Because according to him, it's still the police's fault. It's still my fault. It's everybody else's fault except his own. He has written letters that was put on the children's grave where he wrote to each child that it is my fault that he murdered the children. So there's no acceptance of responsibility. Charlotte says 17 years after the incident, the pain never goes away. She has a room dedicated to her slain kids with all their favorite toys and clothing items, and she calls the room her sanctuary. It doesn't break your heart, it breaks your soul. It breaks your soul. It's like this morning again. Um, I was looking at, at the photos of the kids, and you know as a mother, you know that cheeks that you kissed, that little bodies that you hugged, their smells, and you don't forget that. You don't forget that. So it is, and, and having to, to fight, and it's, it's tiring and emotionally draining. And they're not coming back, not even. Several NGOs and gender-based violence activists are expected to protest at Malmasbury Prison in her support during the hearings. The Department of Correctional Services has confirmed the hearings. Tandi Swamau, SABC, Cape Town. All right, on this we are now joined via video link by research specialist in gender-based violence at University of Johannesburg, Lisa Vetten. Lisa, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. What perhaps makes this crime even more devastating is that, you know, the fact that Marius van der Westhuizen was a senior member of the SAPS and the acting station commissioner at the time of, uh, you know, the crime. And he was supposed to be a person who takes over GBV victims. Victims. I mean, how likely, just listening to that report we've just heard, is he to receive parole given his wife's insistence that he is not rehabilitated? All right, it seems that uh, Lisa is, um, uh, is frozen at the moment. Her video link is uh, frozen, uh, but we'll see if we can try and get her back um, as soon as possible on that case um, as we continue.
All right, let's continue our conversation with Lisa Vetten, who is a research specialist in gender-based violence at the University of Johannesburg. Of course, our story is around the former senior police officer in the Western Cape, Lisa Marius van de Vestezen, who will be applying for parole after serving 12 um, of his 24-year sentence. I was uh, saying, uh, Lisa, just to repeat the question on behalf of our, uh, our viewers, of course, uh, is that what makes this case even that much more devastating is the fact that this man was a senior police uh, member, you know, um, also an acting station commissioner at the time of his crime. How likely is, is he, you know, to receive parole, just given what we've heard in terms of uh, how the murders happened, and also the fact that his wife believes that he's not fully rehabilitated? That's always an an important consideration when it comes to parole is there like does this person pose a danger to others have they taken responsibility do they express any kind of remorse have they taken part in any programs that have um, attempted to try to alter their behavior so those would be some of the things that a parole board would look at um and i think depending on that we'll decide whether or not he is um he ought to be granted parole and they would obviously also take into account what his his former wife has to say about him and how safe she feels should he be released. Right, let's uh, continue with this uh, interview, even though our sound is not the greatest, uh, Lisa. Uh, but when you were listening to the interview, I don't know how much of it you heard, but Charlotte, the, the wife who will be opposing parole, um, you know, she too was a senior member of the police service, um, a captain, in fact. I mean, she tells of, uh, you know, telltale signs that we know in as far as GBV is concerned. In fact, I will read this moments before he pulled the trigger, um, you know, in terms of uh, killing his kids. He gave uh, Charlotte an ultimatum to choose between her job or him and their family. And when she answered that she could not decide, he then started killing his children one by one. It just goes to show just how prevalent GBV is. Yes, and I mean, I think the fact that he chose to kill the children is an act of real malice. And he, you know, because leaving her alive to, and an act of real punishment as well, um, you know, for her to remain alive, to think of what, to think of what had happened to the children, it's a very calculated act to make her feel guilty and responsible. It was a deeply, deeply malicious um, and malevolent act in, um, as, as acts of gender-based violence go. I mean, I think there's a broader question here that we need to be asking, which is about looking at acts of gender violence by the police. I think last year we've seen that 122 police officers were reported for rape. And in the six-month period between September last year and March this year, there were about 186 reported for domestic violence. The concern in that case is that probably less than half that had their firearms removed. And this is an issue we need to look at more broadly in terms of what contributes or enables, certainly so doesn't cause, but enables the facility with which a crime like this can happen. And that's the minute you have it, is, is allowing police officers to keep their firearms when they're displayed signs of um, violence or abuse or are a threat in any way. All right, Lisa, thank you so much for your time. Let's leave it there for now. Unfortunately, that sound not getting much better. But that was Lisa Vetten, research specialist in gender-based violence at the University of Johannesburg, of course, weighing in on this story where the former senior police officer in the Western Cape will be applying for parole after serving just 12 years of the 24-year sentence after killing three of his children.